Hello, everybody, to the another OPSI webinar on systemic perspectives and the COVID-19 crisis. So thank you for joining us today at this, uh, this webinar. So we have a very distinguished panel for you today with a lot of people with different backgrounds on systems approaches and system thinking. And we're going to bring those people together to talk about what they have seen from the COVID-19 crisis and uh, what is uh, in their perspective, uh, what governments should be doing or how they should be looking at these new problems and issues and vulnerabilities that are emerging from the crisis uh, that we should be actually looking at or what kind of, um, kind of tools and methods we should be uh, using. I'm going to introduce the panel that we're going to talk to uh, with you a little bit later, but I'm going to give the floor to Kent to actually talk a little bit, uh, give the opportunity for us to see uh, what, where are you coming from and what are your experiences with system thinking and systems approaches. Thank you, Brett. So we'd like to take a moment just to get a sense of who's on the webinar and where everyone is coming from. So I invite you either to open a uh, browser window or use your smartphone and go to www.wooclap.com slash opsysystems. Uh, and that link will be up as I move through. So you can head over there anytime. Uh, there is also a text-based system, um, which I think most of you can avoid. But. So we'd like to start, uh, I'll leave this first question open. Uh, the link's still at the top of the screen, wooclap.com opsy systems. So I'll leave this open for a moment and you can use your phone or a browser uh, to uh, say where you are on the map. cluster in Europe, a few Canadians, Mexico, United States. It looks like someone is specifically from Nova Scotia, which I like to see as a native Nova Scotianer. Furthest east, we're looking at India. Halifax, Nova Scotia, it is. The biggest cluster by far in Europe. Some Middle East, Northern Africa. All right, well, thank you all for joining from wherever you're coming from. And next, so I will next go to what sector you're coming from, if you want to start uh, making note of what sector they work in. So far about 50% from government and a bit of a mix across the rest. A little bit heavy on social sector and, uh, and not the profits. So we've got 41 out of 47 people voting, which is, uh, which is great, thank you. And the last question, just for a little level setting today is what's your level of familiarity with systems thinking and systemic approaches? Brand new, you're familiar, but you're looking for more information. You can see how it works in your organization or this is your bread and butter. And that will give Perez and our panelists a sense of everyone's starting point for the topic. Although now I've just realized that it's just going to be a challenge for them because uh, we haven't even spread over the uh, level of familiarity, so they need to address all audiences at once. So there's the challenge for them today. Oh, 
thank you very much everyone for participating. We'll come back with a few more questions later on in the session and Perez, back over to you. Thank you so much, Kent. Uh, moving on to with the webinar and the speakers engagement as well. So my name is Pyrrha Tenorist. I'm the project manager at uh, the OECD and lead in system thinking and anticipatory innovation governance. So this is also kind of my bread and brother, but I, I would say that there's always things to learn as well. So we'll try to address some different levels of uh, the audience that we have with us today. So a little bit, a uh, few technical notes on how this uh, webinar is actually kind of functioning and uh, how the technical side works. So we ask you to ask questions on the Q&A and question and answers function on Zoom. You'll find it below on the Zoom screen. Uh, please enter your questions there throughout the webinar. And if you want to address them to a specific speaker, please uh, also indicate their name that who you are actually um, addressing it too. We are also recording this webinar, so uh, please do note that afterwards the, also the video and the webinar will be available online on our, on our YouTube uh, channel. And also slides will be shared by email. This is the number one question that we usually get. Uh, slides that we will uh, show today will be shared with you by email to all the participants. Uh, if you want to comment or chat among yourselves or with the OECD and OPSI team who are also on the, online on this webinar, please do show on the chat function. But please put your directed questions to the panel on the Q&A function as well. Uh, I also direct your attention to the Twitter handle. So if you're tweeting uh, or using other social media, uh, please use the hashtag OPSI webinars so we can actually see and engage with your comments online as well. So going forward, uh, this webinar on system thinking and change uh, on the COVID-19 crisis is actually leading forward to a government aftershock event that we have planned on the 17th and 18th of November. So maybe on social media or elsewhere, you have noticed that we have been engaging with a larger audience uh, to co-design this event, which will be held in analog and in person and over online on the 17th and 18th of November where we hopefully will have events going on in over 100 different locations around the world to design what the future of statescraft uh, post-COVID-19 uh, crisis or, or if we're going to live in these conditions uh, onward, what this will look like or what kind of system change uh, we should be thinking about. So this work and this webinar is leading towards that. If you're interested in the event, please do get in touch with us because the co-design sessions are ongoing and you can host an event at your own country underneath the government after shock banner as well. So how do we work? We will uh, have a presentation of panelists uh, coming up for 10 minutes each. And afterwards we will go into questions and answers and discussions when taking questions from OPSI and the observatory, and also from you, from the audience, from the Q&A function as well. And then we'll wrap up and talk about next steps. So why even uh, this topic of system says, systems thinking and the COVID crisis? What we have recently seen, especially also in, from the most unlikely sources. So what you see here is an outtake from a Financial Times article from the, actually the editorial board of the Financial Times saying that radical reforms are essentially essential and needed for the kind of the prevailing policy directions that we have seen uh, previously in government. And this is exceptional, that we have a kind of a general agreement that, that something needs to change, that something needs to change because we have experienced this crisis altogether, even if we have different means and opportunities uh, within this crisis. So there is also a lot of inequality within the crisis. But even from the most unlikely sources, there's a consensus emerging that uh, we as government and also our policies need to systematically change because the change is the crisis has demonstrated that this change is needed. And secondly, we are also being collecting uh, innovative responses from the Observatory of Public Sector Innovation at the OECD. And we have seen a kind of a huge number of innovative responses from government themselves that are usually uh, somewhat tactical at first, but are also going towards uh, strategical 
uh, aims. So we have seen the fundamental increase of real-time data use, digitalization, all of the technologies that existed before, drones, digital solutions that got their kind of window of opportunity during the crisis. We have seen evidence and information being delivered in different ways. We have seen the huge amount of teleworking and automatization solutions being adopted. Uh, government working across CRILOs, private crowding in uh, solutions and resources. And also the amount of uh, kind of approaches and uh, different subsidies and in, in, uh, incentives to actually keep the current economic model going. And now the question is, can we actually uh, sustain that? Can, is our economic model or socioeconomic model or policies sustainable in the long term to kind of have the current bailouts and otherwise? So we all have also seen that there are new needs and vulnerabilities that have already existed and become visible through the crisis or the crisis itself has created. And the conditional support that is now emerging from governments to say, we will help and we will bail out the companies in, uh, in for example, in the air, uh, air flights and, uh, and uh, uh, air force fields, but we will have conditions set up on it. So we want the subsidies and incentives to be collected, connected to sustainability goals, for example. And there have been first attempts of redesign of policies themselves. So we're talking about areas of rethinking urban transportation and urban uh, mobility in urban areas, because the crisis has also say, shown to us that we can actually do things in a different way. But can this momentum be actually held? And how should we be working uh, in, towards this systemic change? So in every policy analysis unit everywhere, I think you have had these uh, kind of uh, trends analysis and system change analysis as well. And this is a particular example from the observatory itself. We had in our midst also kind of the basic needs and, uh, and kind of emerging trends analysis. But the question is, if we do that and if we analyze kind of systemic uh, cascading effects that are coming from the crisis, what are we actually going to do about it? What kind of tools and methods should we use to deliver that change on the ground? So if the systemic change is our goal, then what kind of methods and tools should we be using to actually reach that goal? So we are also uh, trying to make sense of what those new goals uh, should be for government, what those new purposes for government should be. So my colleague Ken Taken uh, is also uh, undertaken a great sense-making uh, activity to actually see what tubes of new narratives are emerging from the response of COVID-19, our solidarity systems or how our perception of inequality or quality and equality is changing, and what kind of new purposes could be emerging through the COVID-19 crisis itself. And now we are going to actually hear from a very distinguished panel how to actually effectively work with systemic change or what they have noted uh, from their experience and background um, to uh, the COVID-19 crisis and how governments have been acting uh, towards it, or what has the response been and how they can actually do it in a more uh, systems, systemic manner. So today we have on our panel uh, Laurent Pontor, Andrea Cooper, uh, Marco Steinberg and Ira Helslot, and all from very different backgrounds, uh, different experiences. So Laurent comes from the senior foresight, uh, uh, foresight section of the European Commission at the Joint Research Centre and has a great uh, experience and background in doing futures thinking and foresight access exercises for the European Commission. Uh, but also has been involved uh, with developing the kind of complexity and systems tools for the uh, European Commission as well. Uh, Andrea Cooper, uh, or to say Dr. Andrea Cooper, comes from the Policy Innovation Unit of the UK Cabinet Office and she has been leading the work there uh, since uh, 2014 and has also proposed recently a systems thinking or systems tool for government to work with innovation in a systemic manner. Uh, Marco Steinberg uh, is very well known in the kind of systems design and strategic design fields. A founder of Snowcon and Haystack, he consults governments around the world on systems issues. Uh, previously, he has been the design director of uh, CITRA, the innovation fund uh, in, uh, in uh, Finland, and also being the lead of the Helsinki Design Lab. Uh, 
And also we have Ira Helslot, who is the Professor of Governance of Safety and Security at Radboud University, uh, but also the head of the crisis lab in, uh, in the Netherlands that deals with educating, training and providing policy advice on kind of crises and uh, systemic risks. So from very different backgrounds, we're going to hear now how they see the COVID-19 crisis and what type of systemic uh, effects could be emerging from them and what kind of tools to use to engage with that. I'm going to give the floor first to Laurent. Uh, here you go. Okay, <clears throat> thank you very much, Pirat, and uh, thank you for having invited me to participate in this uh, event in, in, and share my thoughts in such a good company. Um, so what I'm going to say here represents my personal views and not the official position of the European Commission, to, just to make uh, things clear. Um, so, indeed, the world uh, has gone through and is still going through a major shock, which is considered systemic by many people and which will have very deep and long term consequences. And so what my observations are in terms of the response to this is that this has given rise to two types of narrative in, in the media in response to this. The first narrative is let's go back to normal as soon as possible. You know, this is a crisis. We have to fix everything to go back to normal. The second one is let's not waste a good crisis and really use the opportunity to embark on a serious sustainable transition because we see that, you know, that the, the system was already vulnerable. So, you know, now we have to make it, uh, make the, the action sure so that we can really move towards sustainability. In terms of government response, we've seen that, you know, some governments are really acting on the, on the first narrative. Uh, many other governments are, really taking emergency measures broadly constrained by how things were before the pandemic. And the European Commission has really taken a clear stance to not do this and really engage with its EU Green Deal. And uh, so this must go hand in hand with uh, the digital and green transitions that the Commission uh, is pushing for. So we've seen a few days ago the publication of what people call the next generation EU recovery package, which plans to invest in repairing the EU's social fabric, protect its single market, help rebalance balance sheets across Europe. And it tends to fast forward towards a green, digital and resilient future. And it does so with a clear vision to promote human dignity, to promote the rule of law, and of course, to promote EU values in general. So there's clearly a window of opportunity to do things differently and some people are starting to use it. So in periods of profound change, and I consider this now period now to actually be one of them, uh, the established worldviews lose their capacity to explain the world. But at the same time, new, more adapted worldviews have difficulty to emerge, uh, or at least if they exist, they have difficulty still to gain traction. And crisis can speed that up. So they can speed this shift from one worldview to, to another one. And so, of course, in such times, uh, there is a big challenge to institutions. Uh, if they want to survive, if uh, the government system wants to preserve their ability to take policy action, you know, and to drive uh, the building of a new future, uh, they really have to keep making sense to those uh, they serve. And this means that these organizations must evolve to remain relevant in a very fast changing context and they must fit with the emerging worldviews that progressively become dominant. And so for those of you who are familiar with foresight, and I guess most of you are, you know, you have methods like the causal layer analysis methods, for example, which is very adapted to help really chart this course, help governments go through these uh, rough, rough waters and uh, actually, you know, rise up to the challenge of the magnitude of the change. So in my opinion, the vulnerabilities that we're exper experiencing today, why they are revealed by the pandemic, uh, are witness to the growing inadequacy of the worldview that led to the establishment of the underlying systems we are uh, living with now. And I have the impression that what the pandemic has done is not so much to change the global long-term trends, but rather to accelerate them brutally. And uh, a, paradigm, a paradigm shift is engaged and the COVID-19 systemic shock is really revealing it. So 
while this deep change is engaged, um, if our civilization and if its governance systems want to show its resilience and sail through this, uh, we must create the circumstances to allow change to happen. In other words, the question is to ask whether to provide public resources to save old structures or to provide resources to help the people affected and the structures affected by the failure of this old system to prepare for new opportunities. So these are very complex and very difficult questions for a government. And when very strong underlying trends creates these simultaneous shocks, you know, the, the existing systems fight for survival, but they're also encountering a high risk of failure. And so that's what we need to address. So letting that happen could be devastating, but trying to restore the system to its previous state is you know, possibly a self-defeating strategy. So we have to be very, very aware of this. You know? Doing this would bring the system back to a state which is no longer adapted to the circumstances and to the surrounding environment and increases the, actually the ultimate risk of failure. Therefore, it becomes really vital to understand quickly what the key leverage points are you know, and help the systems adapt and reach a new state which is better adapted to the new conditions. And the challenge for the people in charge at this point in time is to make the complex intuitive and to find these leverage points as quickly and as accurately as possible. So at the EU Policy Lab in the Commission, we've tried to grapple with this. You know, we are not really top world experts in these kind of things, but we've tried to actually take a very pragmatic approach. And uh, on the basis of Donella, Donella Meadows' work, we have developed a tool that we call the Complex System Analyzer, which in fact is a sort of two-day workshop to really help people uh, identify these leverage points in a, in a complex system and connect them to a future vision, which is better aligned with uh, a worldview that could have um, a longer lasting uh, shelf life, let's say, that, that a dying worldview. So these are just a few considerations I want to give as an introduction to the, to the discussion. And uh, I'm ready to take any of the questions that might come from uh, the audience and uh, to listen to also what uh, the other experts have to say. Thank you very much, Piet. Thank you so much, Laurent. Uh, also from my side is that I've taken a look at the complex systems analyzer and it's an, a fantastic tool uh, to use. And it's also available, if I'm not mistaken, as a creative commons. So everybody can actually uh, use it within their own sector or their own policy field. So do take a look at the European Commission website. All the materials uh, should be accessible or if they're yes, not, then you can also have them uh, uh, from the European Commission themselves. And now I'm going to call uh, from uh, uh, Andrea to give us an overview of what has uh, Policy Lab been thinking and doing around systems uh, during the COVID-19 times. Hello, hi. Um, hi everyone, uh, great to see so many people uh, joining this uh, webinar. Um, similarly, uh, I come from a perspective of really uh, a civil servant within uh, the UK government. So what I'm going to talk about is not political. Um, and in the Policy Innovation Unit, our interest is very much in understanding uh, how uh, policy making is done, uh, not so focused on what the policy is. Uh, and we work across the whole of government. Um, and I have some slides that I would like to share with you really that it's very much a uh, work in progress. Um, so I need someone to uh, enable this, the attendee to slide share. Is that possible on your side? Oh, one moment. And so the Policy Lab, um, as was said before, uh, was, yeah, uh, thank you. Can everyone see that? Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Someone. Yep. <laughs> okay. Perfect. So um, this this is the uh, normal environment where the policy innovation uh, unit exists. But obviously, at the moment, I'm coming from um, my home in Cornwall. And we often talk in, in the policy lab about, in effect, the art of the possible. And I think one of the things I would like to start with really is a sense of how that 
the possibilities have changed uh, and I think that's quite central to what we're talking about today. And yesterday I was in uh, London and I took this photograph and it's just so evident how rapidly the change has happened. Um, you know, a normal street, normal time, days would be incredibly busy and uh, it, it was eerie how quiet uh, London uh, was yesterday. And so I think that uh, a lot of what our interest in the policy lab is about is how we might work more systemically. And actually, whether it's the biggest sphere that we have, our planet, in terms of uh, net zero and global sustainability, or perhaps the smallest sphere, uh, one that we can't even see, um, these are both examples where no single government, no uh, single policy team can solve it alone. It, it's a really complex interdependent uh, issue and so really it is about dealing with complexity and I love the work that Royal Society of Arts and Rowan who's uh, on the call here um, have been doing around uh, think like a system act like an entrepreneur and really just to flag the three elements you need for that so whether it's um, environmental sustainability or whether it's COVID it is a mixture of individual collective and systemic um, action if you like so um, on COVID individual actions might be washing your hands but that's not enough to deal with the uh, virus. Uh, social uh, networks might rally around and provide food for people but again that isn't sufficient and of course governments have a really important role to play here with their formal structures and really moving into this much more command control model that we've seen in different governments around the world. So when taken together we have I think potential for this systemic change. So in the policy lab, what we've been doing over a number of years now is building a toolkit I just wanted to share with you for uh, uh, systems, which we call government as a system. And it really starts to think about those three elements, the three actors, if you like, individuals, um, communities, and what government might do. And so this is from a workshop we did on industrial strategy and local industrial strategy, getting all the people involved in coming up with ideas and uh, action but then assigning those to different actors within the system, whether it's individual action, a collective action or government action. I need that in a different colors. And so we're also interested in really bringing together different expertise and see it as a much more of an ecosystem of agency. And some people will own problems and challenges and some people will be enablers of new ideas. And of course we have experts as well. They're really bringing all these people together in, in new ways in order to find uh, fresh perspectives. And of course, there, I think the other thing I wanted to say up front really is that we're interested in a mixed economy here. It isn't only it's called government as a system, but it's not just government. It is actually understanding the role of the private sector, understanding entrepreneurs, uh, social sectors and so forth. And, and these hybrid value chains, the way that value is created across complex system. So many, some of you may have seen before the policy labs uh, styles of action. Uh, which is the basis of our government as a system toolkit and it really has been used to demystify the, the kind of role that government might play in these kinds of crises so um, government can uh, obviously legislate it regulates it funds things um, but it also has much softer powers where it might collaborate or enable others and so from these different uh, levers if you like um, we created initially a, a grid of 28 actions um, and started to test that out on different policy areas. This is the future of maritime um, and the ocean in the world of artificial intelligence. And thinking about different people in that system coming together to come up with new ideas. And more recently, we've been to update that uh, government as a system toolkit. And now it contains 56 different actions. And the reason it's much bigger is that we have sought to map local, regional, national and international government action so that we can start to address some of these much bigger systemic uh, challenges that really reside across different jurisdictions and uh, but it still has that same deal from the kind of more formal powers uh, through to the softer powers of advising or role modeling through to lawmaking and prosecuting for example um, and so um, we published this quite widely i know this is a that you can't see uh, if I were to simplify this down just to the verbs, um, it becomes uh, less, less examples perhaps, but it actually is easier to then deal with. Uh, so the different kind of action that government might take, and just thinking about that in terms of the verbs. 
And this is the basis of the toolkit that we uh, are working on. And so we've been looking at a number of different areas where government is interested, such as net zero, um, through the lens of this toolkit to see what aspects of the tools might come to life. And so um, I've also um, had a look at doing a little demo of what it would look like for COVID. And of course, needless to say, this is not um, a review in detail. This is literally just a demo of saying, well, at different stages, as COVID has emerged, which powers uh, do different governments use? Um, and so you start to see different parts of the grid, the toolkit light up. And in the early stages and early response on COVID, there was a lot of work around forecasting and modeling, working out what was the nature of the problem, and then also advising. Um, as we moved into intervention, as time progressed, um, a lot more actions started to come into place where actually funding uh, and prevention action uh, also. And as you expect, that then grows over time into actually then different governments legislating, changing the laws, and then bringing in different ways to actually support the action. So, of course, I think potentially at some point um, in any policy area, you might want to use the whole of the, the grid. Um, so you can set out different policies using this grid, and we wanted to use it really to help those different actors come together uh, around different problems and have a shared language um, so that we can uh, start to draw new ideas. So I just wanted to give you in the final couple of minutes some thoughts on some models that we've been using about what the future of policymaking might be, um, what's emergent uh, post-COVID. And uh, one of the models that we use a lot in the lab is uh, the idea of strategic niche management, um, which really understands that you know, progression in terms of a set of experiments over time, and that you can take a number of rather micro actions, but uh, when taken together, they can create a, the potential for a bit of a paradigm shift. And I think this is probably quite a useful model for uh, COVID in that there is a previous situation, a kind of liminal state, and then we'll be moving into a future state and each of these offers potential for a bit of a paradigm shift. Um, but it also makes the point that you, you don't do it all in one go. Uh, you make small moves and small action. And um, in the team, we have uh, quite a lot of uh, designers and um, foresight uh, expertise. And so we've been thinking about really bringing those two worlds together with speculative design on the uh, future, so really thinking about the future in new ways and expanding the uh, Overton window, if you like, to really think about what was previously quite radical or unthinkable, which suddenly becomes a bit more possible. And so this is this core idea of the art of the possible. Um, and then really, I think one of the things that um, I wanted to flag here is this idea that the the next paradigm perhaps um, might look and feel very different. And I really like Bill Reed's work on this, where he described, if you like, two very different worldviews, one which is technical, uh, which is a traditional bureaucracy, if you like, um, of doing things right and being efficient, moving into one that's much more um, regenerative and restorative, which is actually about doing the right things. So allocative efficiency over technical efficiency. Um, and it invokes very different modes of working. And I, and I think it'd be really interesting to start to ask the question in a post world of what might regenerative public services look like. And so, you know, we're starting to see new fabric appearing on the streets of towns and cities. And of course, some things will need to be decommissioned. And it'll be really interesting to note the moments in time when we start to kind of airbrush out the interventions that have been brought in, in in the short term as new models emerge and how long we will live with the legacy of uh, the decisions um, that we make. And so really my final slide really is to say I think when we look at policy futures there is huge potential of seeing them in this whole system way um, in, in terms of action across local, regional, international contexts. Um, but I think I have to have an adaptive mindset that understands the problems and uh, solutions will emerge together. And in doing so, we'll need to have much more grounded research in terms of new data sources that tell us how are we doing and what do we need to adjust. Um, and I think if we do that, then I think that there is real potential to have quite a seismic effect through taking uh, what might outwardly appear to be small steps. So um, that's me um, and I look forward to the questions. 
Thank you so much, Andrea. It's great to see that inside government, uh, governments have been starting to use the system thinking and systems approaches in, in practice. I am going to also remind people that you can ask questions from the panelists and uh, to do so, please go to the question and answer function. Uh, any comments you may have for the speakers, you can put the, in the chat function, but please put the question and the questions in the question and answer function so we can keep uh, an eye on them and nothing will get lost uh, in the chat itself. I'm going to give it over to Marco now to very amply probably to talk also how design contributes to system change. Thank you. Everybody can see my screen? I, I yeah. assume so. All right, great. Thank you. Um, actually, before I get started, I just want to say a huge congratulations to Andrea. It's her last day at the Policy Lab. And Andrea, you've been an inspiration to all of us and been doing some very valuable and uh, pioneering work. So great, great to have you here and, and hear your thoughts. Uh, I know you're going to be going on to do even more brilliant work. That said, I'm going to try to paint a bit of a picture that uh, we'll repeat a bit of the threads that were shared by some of the uh, other uh, speakers before me. And I think some things that are in common knowledge, but I just want to kind of paint a bit of a picture. So I'm going to go through these four, four sort of uh, things. Um, talking about the big picture, some learnings from COVID right now, just a few pickings there, some principles that I think are useful, and then uh, a few reflections on advice uh, moving forward. So First of all, I'd like us to frame this that the COVID-19 crisis is not a COVID-19 crisis. And, and what I mean by that is that this is actually uh, a crisis that emerged by COVID exploiting a flawed system of governance, a system of public governance that is not aligned with its purpose. Right? And so I, I hope that we don't as, as time goes by, think of it as the COVID crisis and then further narrow it down as a crisis of ventilators. I mean, for me, that would be the kind of trajectory that would be most destructive. We need to understand this is a symptom of much deeper underlying kinds of issues. And I'll share a bit, uh, thinking I've shared before, but to just frame it for the audience is that I think we, when we look at it from a historical perspective, I'm just taking GDP and this is for England. We need to understand that this GDP curve per capita is pretty much flat for most of history. Um, and that I would say it was act one of sort of a three part act that we are in the midst of. Uh, the second part of this act was after the industrial revolution, many things coming together, but also our concepts of modern governance and systems of governance of uh, professional public administration, uh, all of these things coming together in a kind of modern gate guys and and you, you look at the gdp per capita and it's exponential the growth it's absolutely amazing and in fact in that period um uh, sort of uh, quality of life measures uh and life expectancies and many things doubled within a generation within 50 years uh, that kind of change in people's lives would have taken six thousand years in act one so in a certain way we created a system that delivered extraordinarily efficiently and created benefits for a lot of people, but not everybody and not at an expense. And I think act three, what we're really doing, which is where we are right now, is we're reckoning with some of that. Uh, who did it benefit and at what cost? And you know, I'm pointing to obvious things, but one of the costs has been actually uh, at the, uh, the ecological footprint of our planet. And now we far exceed it. Another one has been an inequality. We've seen the gap between the have and the have nots grow uh, very, very significantly. And if I take Helsinki, for example, and here are three maps put together, we see that COVID prevalence aligns pretty nicely or badly, I would say, with where unemployment is highest and where uh, inhabitants of Helsinki with an immigrant background coincide. And we're seeing these dynamics, and I think these kind of represent, um, and if we were to look at them together, sort of, we see some real hotspots, right? Um, 
And, you know, while, while Finland has fared quite well, when we look at these neighborhood hotspots in relation to the average, the mean, or, or the majority of the country, we see that the reddest areas have an eight time greater prevalence of COVID than the rest. Um, and we know what the story in the U.S. has been. Um, and I'll just put this in a very black and white way, quite literally. In the U.S., just based on the color of your skin, if you're black, we had 13.2 deaths per 100,000 people. And just based on the color of your skin, if you're white, 5.7. So you're twice as likely just based on the color of your skin. So here we already begin to see that COVID and Black Lives Matter are inextricably bound to them. And I'll come back to that in, the, in, in, in a moment. And so I think, you know, there are many things we could point to. What is this really a quest, question of the systemic issues? But I would say inequality is one and the kind of long-term liabilities that we're now beginning to have to pay, whether it's with climate change uh, or many of these other kinds of related issues. And now is the time to kind of pay up. And so we cannot expect that the old system will carry us Forward, but we have to really use this moment to build a new kind of system. And, and when I think of kind of systems, you know, these, these are very ambiguous, very complex, highly interdependent. And people could spend all day talking about them till the blue in the face and becomes very complicated. The question is, how do you act on them? And so I think acting on them means acting on things that are very precise and that are great entry points into a much bigger set of issues. And that's why I actually think that Black Lives Matter is, is one of the most interesting entry points and really taking that on and the term anti-racist. Uh, I'll come back to this in a second. So what are some of the learnings or some of the things that we can point to? Um, Vietnam fared far better than anybody else. I mean, people may know this, the numbers, but it's staggering. Almost 100 million people, zero deaths from COVID, 350 cases. And they did it because they were nimble, smart. They shifted procurement allotments. They brought culture and media together in ways that were extraordinarily dynamic. And I think the big picture that we're beginning to see, or at least a hypothesis, is that countries that have had SARS and other kinds of pandemics in the past, or that are regularly under typhoids or hurricanes and other kinds of systems, if systems, the underlying systems of governance are in place, have been able to exercise a kind of muscle. If those underlying issues aren't in place, then you may not be exercising your mind. In comparison, in Finland, which some may say is a kind of, uh, you know, good pupil in the class of uh, public governance, while we fared very well with COVID overall, this has been an incredible stress test for us. And we've seen a lot of the failures um, in there. Finland had a 2008, I believe, preparedness strategy for pandemics like this one. It hadn't been touched or revisited since 2008. It was basically just a piece of paper on a shelf, right? Uh, we had re strategic reserves, the masks, the ventilators, and all that stuff, everything and ready for a pandemic like this. And we opened the strategic vaults for the first time after the World War II to Grand Fanfare, I think it was in March, only to realize that most of the stuff or half the stuff had expired and was no longer usable, right? And we've taken this kind of very linear kind of industrial way of thinking about preparedness, which actually left us completely unprepared um, on there. Um, on March 12th, the government decided that anybody coming into Finland would have to be quarantined, March 12th. Uh, after March 12th, 200,000 people came through Helsinki airport without anybody talking to them or giving them any kind of instruction. And the reason was that there are four agencies at the airport, the border guards that fall under the interior ministry, customs, which are part of the finance ministry, Finavia, which runs the airport. Um, and then we have the uh, quarantine gu guidelines, which come from the Ministry of Health. Nobody had actually thought about how we begin to work in an integrated manner and who has authority and how do we actually work in this manner? They thought a degree would translate automatically into action in the field, right? So we've learned a lot about who's fared well and who hasn't fared so well. Sorry, I'm flipping some paper here just so I can. Um, we know like my dear colleague, Sasha Hasselmeyer is quick to remind us that austerity is here. And it's actually kind of shocking because very few are talking about it and even fewer have ideas on the table. 
And I think we need to make sure that we are clear about the magnitude of this. So uh, Sasha wrote very, a very interesting piece on the city of Santa Monica in California is facing a $224 million shortfall gap in their budget on a 650 million yearly budget. That's a 35% gap in their budget. Now they're lucky because their fiscal year is July 1st. So they're gonna kind of split that between two years. The city of Helsinki has a gap right now of over half a billion euros, 12% of its overall budget. And this is a number that's come out of only four months of COVID. So what happens if we have a second wave? Who are gonna be doing, you know, working on this? And, and I just did a really quick pencil sketch and I don't think it's crazy to say that we were gonna have budget gaps because these come out of dwindling tax revenues, higher unemployment and rising costs of healthcare uh, and other things, right? So I don't think it's unreasonable to say, and I'm provoking the conversation a bit to say that we might have 25 to 50% budget gaps after this is all over in 195 countries and over 100, uh, 10,000 cities across the world. I, I, that's pretty, I think, uh, uh, unprecedented to uh, some degree. Uh, as I said, preparedness needs to be completely reimagined. And I think right now when we saw that our global model has been to offshore a lot of industrial capacity, we're beginning to think that actually you may want to keep some industrial capacity close within nations because having though the ability to make masks and other things quickly becomes even, even more uh, important. Uh, and we're realizing that risk in terms of probabilities, a probabilistic definition of risk, that means do we have the probabilities to say what is the risk of an issue is no longer the basis of decision making. Because on a lot of this stuff, we don't know. Um, and so it changes the dynamic and the nature of how we make decisions. Um, and I think a question for all of us to think about, there may or may not be a second wave, but if there is, I think success will be measured by those who have learned the most. So right now we're in a kind of ranking of countries. Finland's done pretty, pretty well. Italy's done not so well. But I think the ultimate measure of this will be who has learned the most. Because that will demonstrate that within governance, there's the ability to absorb and transform. And I think this question that, you know, uh, Laurent and others have been asking, will we fall back? Is this an opportunity to fall back or spring ahead? Uh, San Pedro Garza Garcia in the Monterrey metro region was the first municipality in Mexico to be hit by COVID and declare an emergency. And the mayor, Miguel Trevino, said, we have to be sure that we come out of this different and better, because if not, that would be a tragedy. And we see this opinion right across the board in many, many places. Right? But there's going to be huge pressure to rely increasingly on fast, cheap, quick, carbon intensive jobs to get people back into life. So there is a real push and pull on this issue that I don't really see kind of uh, uh, playing out quite well, nobody really addressing. And I think I won't get into this, but we need to be very careful about the institutional reflex. I think even just public administrators are getting very fatigued. Will they have the ability to upkeep this kind of improvisation and, and, and dyna dynamism that we've seen emerge uh, in the long term, I don't know. All right, so I'm gonna really quickly, just forgive me a couple more minutes. Uh, a couple new principles just to be aware of. I think we need to start thinking about a 100 day plan right now. Um, and you know, uh, the pandemic is, has, a, has a, a different history or trajectory around the world, but here in Europe, it feels like we're in the eye of a storm where everything is calm. We just had the first wave of the hurricane hit us and we know there's the potential for the next one to come. And I think that 100 days, things are calming down. I see politics as usual coming back in. There's going to be a huge political reckoning, the interest to get back to work. The opportunity and the window for action is extraordinarily short. So I think it's great that in November, we're going to continue this conversation. But November, we may have seen that we've locked ourselves out of options. I think we need a new leadership model that's not built around risks and probabilities. How do you build that is a question. And I think we need new capabilities and assets. All right, very quickly, some advice. I think we need to address legacy lock-ins. We have a highly carbon intensive economy that's still very dependent, that is in a way inextricably bound to Black Lives Matter. We need to run away from that quickly. So are we willing, for example, to give big, uh, a big buyout to the carbon industry to buy them out of carbon? Uh, will that in the long term be a better strategy? I'm talking pretty sort of radically. I think we need an exit strategy 
Finland has developed one because if we continue to assume that we're just going to deal with the crisis, that the pressure to maintain the same trajectory, trajectory A here, uh, will be incredible. So it's only by intervening into the current logic that we can transition the system to something sort of better. But in Finland, our exit strategy has been developed by 79 people uh, in many groups. Two thirds of them are men, zero people of immigrant background in this group. Helsinki has over 17% people with immigrant backgrounds. So, and this is in a country that has gender parity. So I'm not quite sure what this group represents, who they represent, and this is certainly not a creative endeavor. We need creativity. So I think we need to think of exit strategies built on creative endeavors and as a very broad and socially engaged process. I'm not seeing a conversation about the future. We need to realize assets. I'll come back to that in conversation if we want. And I think lastly, I would say we really need to invest in austerity um, because it's coming. And we need to cut to invest, not cut to save. And where I'm seeing a conversation like with Santa Monica is cut to save, right? So the very simple way would be to say, take a two to one approach. If you need to save one euro, cut two euros and use that extra euro to invest in the future, bring new capabilities, build new kinds of things. Right? But this has to happen in a hundred day window. Thank you. Thank you, Marco. Always a pleasure to uh, listen to you and, and to have a kind of a frank call out of all the things that uh, are coming up because uh, I feel as Eve as well that the uh, window of opportunity of buying yourself out of the crisis is getting narrower and narrower and already has gone away. So we actually have to think about the new models. If this continues, then we cannot actually buy ourselves out of it. But how to deal with risks in a systematic way and what is the role of regulation in all of this? We are um, we're going to hear from uh, Ira from, and their crisis lab experience from the Netherlands. I'm giving the floor to you. Thank you, uh, dear Piret. Uh, <clears throat> hello, everybody. Thank you for uh, listening to me. Uh, after, after having some uh, esteemed panelists talking about the big picture, I will talk about a much smaller picture. Um, after uh, our introduction, in which Piret stated that uh, we needed more of uh, government, perhaps uh, the way out is uh, less of uh, government. Uh, let me explain uh, this by giving you a few examples. Um, and of course, we're looking specifically at the field of uh, safety and security. Um, what we found in the, this uh, last three months is that all over Europe, uh, in fact, um, inspections, uh, regulation, your, uh, inspections by government or decentral authorities of a, uh, a regulation have more or less halted. So for a quarter of a year now, uh, what we always believed was essential uh, to do, to inspect society, uh, to make sure that they uh, uh, oblige to our rules. Uh, well, we've ceased to do it and uh, well, a lot of things have collapsed in these three months, uh, but that's because of COVID, not because of us not inspecting society. Uh, in fact, um, there have been written uh, much uh, uh, nice papers about the uh, co-production that took place uh, in these last three months. And they have, it has been celebrated uh, in a way that society came up with creative new in initiatives, sometimes what they in, in co-production with other uh, actors within society, sometimes within, with uh, uh, the government itself. Um, um, so if we take that as a starting uh, um, observation, well, is, is, is this, this observation surprising? Perhaps not. Uh, there has been written a lot about uh, the fact that the way we as a uh, as governments and inspections look at society is that we are uh, probably too much rule-based. We have a set of regulations and when we inspect, we want to make sure that uh, actors within society adhere to these regulations, but we also know that um, there has been estimations that perhaps 80% of all regulation in effect does not correspond with a positive outcome. Uh, and I'm of course talking about safety and security because that's my field of expertise. Um, 
But for example, the Dutch building uh, codes, uh, um, which we have studied, uh, uh, exist for something at least 60% of rules that does simply do not make sense. And just to give you one example, which is a worldwide example, and one of my um, uh, hobby horses, so to speak, is the uh, famous, uh, uh, or, or at least well-known, uh, signs, we have the exit signs of, uh, in case of a fire. Uh, it's been researched uh, a dozen uh, times at least, uh, even one of my PhD students uh, did her thesis about it, uh, that nobody actually ever looks at these emergency exit signs when there's an emergency. So we have this, this of course it's just a small example, but just to, as an illustration, we have a uh, regulation all over Europe, uh, in fact, uh, all over the world, uh, with a, a safety, uh, safety regulation, with a safety measure, which just, just not, does not help, which we know as uh, scientists, uh, but which we up to now have not been able to convince uh, at least the regulators not uh, well, to take it out of the regulation and or uh, inspectors not to inspect. Uh, uh, for this, this not working uh, measure. Um, so perhaps it's, it's uh, not a surprise that now we have stopped inspecting rules which are in the majority are not really making sense, so to speak, from an outcome uh, based perspective, uh, that we have, uh, uh, that society has not collapsed. Um, so that's the first observation. And the second observation, well, I think that Marco uh, uh, already presented that. Um, there's a new, this, this COVID crisis uh, will have enormous reper repercussions on the budget available to uh, governments too. Um, and um, it's also clear that um, uh, uh, we need to invest to prevent people uh, getting into uh, extreme poverty because we know that has an enormous health effect. Um, and, and I may differ for in, in, from opinion with some of the panelists in the fact, in, in the fact that uh, the effects of the COVID itself are um, arguably already much less uh, than the effects of our reaction to that. Uh, so um, uh, even in the Netherlands, we can easily compute uh, that we uh, that COVID itself uh, will have uh, uh, up to now uh, has caused something like a, a perhaps uh, something like 15 to 20,000 lost uh, uh, life years. Uh, but uh, the economic crisis which we are going through will predictably and uh, um, unless we start really doing something else, something else like investing in, in preventing poverty. Uh, but this economic crisis will uh, uh, will lead to up to a million uh, lost life years because of people falling back into poverty, even in the Netherlands. Uh, uh, and we know that even in the Netherlands, uh, the 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 difference uh, in life expectancy between somebody who has a average income and somebody who has a low income, uh, not ex uh, even uh, extreme poverty is uh, 10 years. So the life expectancy fall of people uh, 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 going at, uh, uh, through this economic crisis for uh, say five, year, uh, five years may lead to a two years uh, loss of life expectancy. And this is of course enormous figures and means that we need uh, to uh, find out how we can um, uh, cut costs to invest in the things like Marco uh, suggested. Um, so we have this enormous apparatus which now uh, uh, makes up and inspects uh, safety regulation, regulation which we know that is uh, at least partly uh, not useful and we know that we need to cut costs. Um, um, well, the, 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 the the, the most sensible things perhaps might be uh, uh, to uh, uh, start or to continue what we're doing now um, to uh, cut uh, inspections for at least something like 80, 90 percent, uh, if and only if we would know uh, what uh, kind of uh, part, what part of the regulation is part of the regulation that is really 
uh, uh, well, has a positive outcome. So the part of the regulation that we should adhere to. And that's, that's difficult for uh, governments to find out. Um, so what I propose, um, uh, what I would propose is that uh, we uh, go through a system change in which we um, uh, uh, change responsibility for uh, controlling, inspecting the regulations, or perhaps even uh, writing out regulations in detail um, from governments to the same uh, other actors in society that up to now in these three months were able to to well to come up with a working system um, um, and uh, uh, this, this system has been described and even implemented in subdomains uh, it's a system uh, that uh, very much points out that there is a legal liability for the risk you cause uh, and so for the damage you cause um, and to make sure that there are no free riders uh, people or actors should be a mandatory uh, insured. Um, um, uh, that's, that, that's a difficult concept for governments to uh, embrace because it means that they would have to take a step down and trust that in interaction between the actors in society uh, and their insurance uh, companies, a sensible form of regulation and inspection takes place. Um, let me give you two small examples in which we have seen that this is uh, this is actually working. Um, an example from France is the way their building uh, uh, system works. If you have a, uh, want to build something in France, um, there is not, like for example in the Netherlands, an elaborate check upon the regulation by a government, uh, but you have to show that you are insured. Um, and then it's up to the insurance company to make sure that there's some kind of inspection if they want, otherwise uh, uh, a risk-based approach, they can say, well, we trust this actor, but otherwise they do some inspections and uh, needless to say, an insurance company will never inspect on emergency signs, knowing that that does not have any effect uh, upon uh, the outcome uh, of, of construction or fire safety. And another example from the Netherlands, uh, um, also a little bit old, but is that in the 90s of um, uh, the, the previous century, we had uh, uh, a series of accidents with, when transporting uh, dangerous goods. And the sensible reaction at that time was, uh, after analysis, that more inspections would not be uh, helpful. Uh, but we changed the system um, in the sense that everybody who is uh, going to transport uh, dangerous goods has a, a legal liability, a risk-based liability of 10 million euros. So whatever happens, even if, if it's not your fault, you are liable for 10 million euros uh, and you have to be insured. Uh, and that combination uh, um, has within uh, one or two years led to a, a, a remarkable improve in the safety of uh, the transport of dangerous goods in the Netherlands. And of course, uh, even from an OECD, or especially from an OECD point of view, this also may have downsides in the sense that small companies, uh, if you're uh, working for yourself and you're transporting dangerous goods, it's almost impossible to get a, a, an insurance. Uh, but perhaps for this kind of risk, it's, uh, uh, well, it's even better that you don't have, uh, uh, let's say, amateurs, so to speak, uh, that, that perform this activity. Um, now, I think that a lot of scientists, uh, also some of, of, of the colleagues at the OECD who really uh, understand this and who are in favor of this system, but we find that there are two big different barriers which up to now prevent implementation on a, a larger scale, uh, even in France or in the Netherlands where partly this system has been introduced. And these barriers, of course, you may predict are, well, the first is, is let's say, the concept of a colleague uh, called a greedy government, uh, which is the concept that governments find it very difficult to let down, to let go of responsibilities. Uh, well, on the contrary, they feel uh, the urge to take over responsibility from civic uh, parties um, uh, because they have a kind of deep distrust of uh, society without regulation. Um, 
and, and well, that would be a real system change if you would, would really try to trust uh, society. And the second one, of course, is that uh, regulation bodies and inspection uh, inspections do not have a uh, um, uh, well from an institution institutional side uh, are not really enthusiastic about letting go of these responsibilities because it also means that they would uh, 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 have to cut staff, uh, uh, get rid of their budget, and uh, in practice nobody is really enthusiastic when its budget is cut by 90% or so. Um, so these are two big uh, barriers which uh, up to now have prevented a, a real, let's say, this change. Uh, this would really real be a systematic change, I believe. Um, uh, but we have not been able to uh, uh, introduce that in many domains um, uh, all over Europe. Um, well, as I said, this is not the global, but the, the big picture, Marco and others, uh, Laurel uh, and, and Andrea pre presented. But this is just, as I believe, is, is in a very specific domain, safety domain, security domain, regulation, inspections. What, what it would mean if you would take these lessons from COVID, uh, these uh, systematic lessons, and try to implement them. Um, and um, uh, also, uh, 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 if you want to change the big things, you should be able to find out or to identify what are the barriers, even in such a specific small change. All right, thank you. Uh, of course, uh, available to all questions. <laughs> Thank you so much, Vera. I think it's very illustrative, especially in the field of kind of safety and security, what uh, governments have been actually keeping themselves busy with during normal times. And the kind of the sense of false security that has been created by these regulation or rules that do not actually work in practice, or as Marco also kind of outlined the, the, the you know, the bunkers of all the uh, safety gear that we had stored that were not actually usable in the current situations. So we actually lack the muscle to do anything in the current crisis and the kind of the rules and regulations that uh, take up a lot of time of policymakers to actually make. It could be resource, uh, resources that could be used elsewhere for something better that could actually deliver impact. But for two minutes, I'm going to actually give it over to Kent, who is going to engage with the audience and ask some questions from the participants. And then we'll go straight to the questions to the, the panelists. Thank you, Brett. So yes, we'll get everyone involved again for a brief moment. So if you missed this earlier when you were starting the meeting, you can go to www.wuclap.com slash systems. I will also put that back in the chat and or uh, either in a browser or on your mobile phone. We have two questions for you. Heather's already on top of it, so it's in the chat. And so for the first question, I'm going to steal Marco's slide and his face in the corner and ask how you feel about the dichotomy of falling back or springing ahead. And so this is which do you, all things being equal, which do you think is more likely or Put differently, do you, how, how strong do you think the forces are that will push us to fall back versus the forces that will encourage us to spring ahead? So you can drop a map pin anywhere on the white line that I added to Marco's slide, treating it as a spectrum. And the links up top as well. Although I would have thought it's possible that something is broken on it. I thought it should be getting something done. There we go. Okay. Um, so to refresh. <laughs> so we have someone that uh, went all the way off the map on the left. Uh, and other than that, we have a, uh, a, a pretty solid range of uh, responses of how likely it is that we'll be able to use the current moment as an opportunity to, for positive change versus reverse. So I'm gonna move on. Uh, and this is a bit of a trick question. So what policy issue area do you think needs more systemic approaches as we look to a, a post-crisis world? And the trick being, of course, that is that as our panelists discussed, 
all of these items are related when you take a, a, a system lens, but also as we heard, there are natural entry points uh, that allow you to start making interventions in these areas. You can also bump up other people's answers by liking them and giving weight to what other people are saying. seeing a, a, a few of all of them, well-being and health, inequality, a new social contract, some about uh, governance writ large. I'm gonna, and uh, as much as I don't like word clouds as analytical tools, it will let us see more than that once. So I'll swap, swap. And inequality, new social contract are the ones that are getting the most votes as well. Energy transition, energy production and use probably coming in. Uh, in, in the top three as well. And I think Perrette said I would have two minutes, so I think I'll end it at that and pass it back over. Thank you so much, Kent. Uh, this is very interesting to see involving in real time. But now I'm going to turn back to the panel and I'll also ask you to unmute yourself so you can also join in on any occasion. Uh, so I'm going to take a couple of questions that have come in and thank you so much for Andrea who has already been sharing so many examples from the UK uh, government in the chat, uh, chat function. Uh, we will copy all of these and we will send you all of these examples by mail afterwards as well. And thank you for Marco already answering questions and Q&A as well. We'll copy all the questions and send them out to uh, the people who have joined in uh, as well after the, the webinar has ended. But I think I, I would like to ask you one of the from a question from Mark Kutbert, who has asked uh, from all the speakers, uh, do you have any good examples or good ideas on approaches for real time learning and change to improve the response now and for the next wave? Uh, that is how we identify lessons in real time and actually learn change in a very short learning loop. So what do governments or us need to do between now and the potential next wave that is potentially going to hit uh, sometime in the autumn or even sooner or never. What do you think? Maybe you can ask, uh, start with Marco. Um, I don't have a total answer, but I, I have maybe a couple elements um, of the answer here, at least from my perspective. I think we need to put, I know this is gonna sound a bit wishy-washy, so forgive me, but I think we need to put uh, learning teams uh, within the core of government and on the front lines. Uh, there's a lot of incredible stuff that's happening just because of the sheer will of people on the front lines, because of citizens mobilizing and so on. And without naming any countries, but especially one country that's very close to where I am right now, I've made some inquiries into prime minister's office and elsewhere. There is no learning mechanism. Uh, the flip side of this coin is myself, as many of my colleagues, approached uh, the central government when the crisis was beginning, and I actually offered my services pro bono. Uh, there were a couple of things that I thought the government was very weak on that we could easily build capacity around, and I got a very polite answer. I got an answer that was like, we've been receiving a lot of offers for help, but at this point, we need to kindly decline. So there's a kind of absurd moment where when governments would need, it's the moment of crisis when they would need the most capacity and new ideas is the moment when they have the least capacity to bring that on board. So I think learning teams in, and now that there's a calm in the storm, the capacity to bring in all those offers to in a way systematize, to make inventory of that and to develop strategy for bringing them in. And I've been talking for many years of the idea of mergers and acquisitions, which businesses do, they buy other companies. Why is it that we want to renew the public sector? We always think of cutting. Why don't we buy in teams, bring in capacities, think about new ways in which those can sort of work. So learning mechanisms and new capacity. I'll leave it at that. Mm -hmm. I'll see that Andrea is also unmuted. So I'll give it over to Andrea maybe. 
Um, yeah, so in the policy lab, the team have spent the last three months really changing the way that we've been working from being more demand led from departments commissioning the lab to focusing the team around COVID and supporting um, the cabinet office more broadly in, in its response. And I think one of the things that we are always keen to do across all our policy projects is to bring together um, the best insights and to do that quite rapidly. So I think we were set up as a team to be in-house so that we were there and ready um, on hand and that we could work sometimes in sensitive subjects that are not public, um, but also so that uh, we can actually bring um, fresh perspectives. And so the, the lab works with external experts and um, the sister team to the policy lab, the open innovation team has been hosting a whole series of seminars with uh, COVID experts coming into government uh, to, to share with officials. Um, the policy lab has also been working on um, thicker data, so the lived experience um, and really understanding using new, I guess, remote methods, how we might apply anthropology and ethnography um, under uh, social distancing. And so we'll be writing a little bit about that in due course. Um, and then also bringing together, of course, the big data and, and the larger data sets that uh, governments often hold. Um, and as the emergent science gives you more information. So I think that um, the lab has, has needed to kind of change the way that we've worked in order to be uh, much more targeted on, on the issues in the short term. But we still bring the same principle of uh, um, bringing greater pace and openness to policy making and doing that much more in a real time way. Um, understanding that lived experience of how a policy is actually affecting people on the ground. So that's what I meant when I said grounded research. Thank you so much. Uh, I'm going to switch over the questions and I'm going to go for a question proposed by Thomas uh, online as well and I'm going to direct it at uh, Laurent. So the question is a very intriguing one. So how, would you, how have you seen any examples that system thinking or systems practice were used in selfless or self-centered ways by leaders? If so, how could we prevent it now into the COVID situation? So really question at the core of uh, if, this ca if this kind of system change is going to be captured by you know, ideological or kind of selfish means. Well, that's a tough question. Um, <laughs> Of course, there is always, you know, human nature at the basis, and um, I think that the people in government, you know, and the, the top level policymakers, uh, are subject to the same biases that everybody is, uh, except that very often they are also subject to much stronger pressures than than other than other people. Um, <clears throat> also, there is, at least in democratic systems, uh, there is a very strong desire to see quick response and quick impact. And there's a, a tendency that stimulates people to think more linearly. You know, you want to do something and then before the next election, you want to see the results so that you can then be reelected. And so there, there, I have the impression that there is often a tendency to stimulate people in high positions to, to think more, more linearly, in spite of the fact that they are in, you know, often in best placed to see the systemic dimension of what they do. You know, different ministers, they have to work together, you know, you have to in, in, ensure coherence across policies. So there is a tremendous need to think uh, systemically. Uh, and so I don't have enough personal experience yet, you know, to really be able to, to answer, you know, with, with concrete examples on this. Um, the only thing I can say maybe is that um, as, as uh, somebody who is about to, to, to join one of these circles, you know, to, to try and promote the use of foresight in these high level circles, I hope that we will be able to improve the way people actually use that kind of systemic thinking. Thank you so much. What I've also seen from my experience is that it's very indicative of uh, who is invited behind the table and how the conversation is facilitated. So definitely kind of pointing back to Marco's uh, point as well at looking at the who are these teams and what are the composition of these teams who are working on COVID responses uh, really is indicative as well of kind of what kind of solutions or whose biases are going to be incorporated in that kind of the, the solution. In that, in that respect, I would like to refer to uh, uh, reports produced last year by the Joint Research Centre, 
which is called Understanding Our Political Nature. And in this report, they dissect the mechanisms and the biases that affect, you know, policy making. And uh, so they make a strong point for collective intelligence. And indeed, you know, in order to develop proper, meaningful collective intelligence, you really have to ensure, I mean, to respect a number of quality criteria to make sure that all the relevant people are at the table, that they feel psychologically safe enough to be able to share all the information they have and they don't start to play, you know, strategic uh, games by hiding parts of the information to derail the whole thing for their own interest. So, you know, you have a whole set of uh, best practice lessons that you have to put in place to, to actually do it. So I think that theoretically, people start to actually know, you know, and it's science-based, you know, how to do it. Uh, now we need to actually make sure that this penetrates the, the policy-making culture, you know, as broadly as possible uh, to make sure that this effectively works. Pira, just, just sorry, I, 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 if it's okay, I wanted to just kind of piggyback on Lauren's point because I think it's really important. And I, I, and I think the question that was posed to us was, you know, has it ever been sort of used to bad ends or whatever? And I, and I would say that there's at least two stories to this. One is, I think what Lauren was talking about, and which I would say I see in my own government here in Finland, 79 people. Um, those 79 people represent a whole bunch of interest groups, it represents all of the union representatives. It's very interesting that other kinds of interests aren't at the table. But in some ways, it's kind of, you know, you checked all the boxes uh, for a kind of a systems perspective, right? You have all the different ministries, you've looked at health, you've looked at education, you looked at this, and it, it, but it's fundamentally not a systems approach. And I think it can kind of, in a way, work against itself uh, because it's got the pretenses of being without actually having the preconditions to do that work. I think if you go back in history, you can see a lot of actually systems work that's been used in very... I think uh, reductive ways. And I think the term systems has migrated from a very engineering concept of systems to a kind of much broader uh, sort of social, uh, cultural, et cetera, et cetera, kind of way of thinking about it. But if you think about the bombing campaign in Vietnam and the American strategy for that, that was built on basically crunching numbers and a very sophisticated systems approach. Um, and it's actually quite fascinating, right? But it was completely flawed but from an engineering perspective, completely like to the, to the spot. So I think what kind of systems approach and what are the preconditions? I think these are very important questions. But I think this is something oh, yeah. that... Yeah. Um, uh, I'm involved also in the, the decision-making in, uh, in a small country and uh, studying the decision-making on COVID in other countries. Um, and I... Uh, well, I'd have to say that there's no country who's really taken a integral, let alone a system-based approach. Um, uh, almost all countries in the end have been uh, um, advised along the lines of not even healthcare, but about uh, a disease control. Um, uh, and, and that means that that well, yeah, as we have this saying, eh? if, you, uh, uh, if you are a hammer, you look at the world as a set of nails. Uh, and that's, that's what was happening. Uh, and it is fascinating, of course, that, that um, for example, this lockdown thing, which happens, has been not, not been described, uh, be described in any uh, uh, plan all around the world as a, as a solution to what has happened uh, uh, to us these, these last months. Uh, because if you look at it a, in, a, in, a, in a let's say in a time in which you have well not even a, syst a systems approach but even a, just a more integral approach, so you get some people who are looking at more than the disease control, but also at healthcare and then let alone economics and the effect thereover. Um, you uh, have this very weird situation that in, 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 in such planning phase, everybody says no, we're not going for a lockdown. But in this, in this, what happens now in these last three months was that uh, far from a, uh, going to a systems or an integral, integral approach, policymakers uh, locked this, themselves in into a, a very specific uh, or an approach based upon just one thing, disease control. Uh, and, and, and as long as the, well, let's say I, I've, 
had the let's say honor to speak to our uh, top decision makers and they say well uh, we don't know how we came in this situation and we sure have no idea how we have to get out but we're not going to admit that we make a mistake and that that's so learning teams yes uh, but i think the only solution and and perhaps our country now uh, yesterday did did at last the right thing by stepping down from uh, COVID control and saying, well, we more or less officially declare this is the end of the uh, COVID situation and we leave to society to come up with, well, we call it the one and a half meter society, but actually it's a, a society in which society has to come up with innovative ways to keep itself safe. Um, uh, so I saw a couple of these questions uh, very uh, 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 understandable focus of, for example, the second wave. Well, I, I believe there are, uh, the only answer we can give is that, that, that governments should step down and leave it to society, to the system, <laughs> to come up with a system-based approach. And perhaps you can, uh, you can facilitate, uh, like the enormous amount of money uh, from the uh, European Union. Um, but I've seen situations in which Perhaps not the the, uh, the system-based approach has been misused eh, for uh, selfish reasons, but uh, without going into details, the situation about healthcare, uh, when an elder the units uh, uh, for the elder, the, the homes for the elderly in the Netherlands has been very much mishandled. Uh, only because our central uh, uh, government did not want to leave solutions to the healthcare uh, uh, sector itself, uh, the, uh, because they felt that would be a shame to trust society, uh, and, but they were not able to come up with a decent solution themselves. Uh, well, uh, yeah. thank you very much for uh, closely uh, running out of time so that there are quick questions as well. I'm going to save the questions and hopefully uh, share them with you later on as, as well. Uh, but thank you very much for all of the viewpoints. Uh, I think from my perspective as well, I'm working on systems thinking and system change at the OECD. We have also seen that uh, governments uh, do are magnificent at doing great things, but also uh, they can also do not so great things. So there are smart governments and not so smart governments. So we also see in the private sector that private sector companies are um, sometimes make great decisions and uh, sometimes their decisions are not so great for the situation that they are in. Uh, we are not fallible in the public sector towards that as well. But what we can do at the moment and uh, talking especially about the second wave and the cascading effects of the crisis itself is that maybe there is a like, great moment of learning at the moment uh, as well to say that we have had a tactical response to the crisis that we have had a crisis that has hit us and we have had to act very fast and sometimes act without having the evidence or knowledge about uh, our uh, sort of our solutions uh, actually the correct ones to take and now um, kind of uh, moving ahead and the many countries are actually opening uh, their businesses and opening their economic systems, but we're still in the effects of waiting for the second wave and, and we will have to contend with the kind of uh, economic repercussions of uh, the crisis itself. It's time to really think about uh, what kind of approaches or muscles in government uh, we need to build up. So what have we learned so far and what do we kind of need to learn further um, to prepare for potentially the second wave, but also prepare and deal with the cascading effects of the crisis itself. And also the issues that the crisis has made visible. So not only for, uh, about the crisis itself, but also inequalities that the crisis has brought to the, for uh, to the forefront that people are really not happy about. So we need different tools and methods and also different uh, muscles to do that. And, of course, involving and co-creating with a larger set of citizens and stakeholders is part of that. And it's extremely important to look at that, you know, which kind of values that we hold dearest and which values are important to us. So from our part, uh, from the OECD and the observatory, great thanks to all the panelists for taking their time to sharing their experience uh, across the board in their respective fields and their opinions. 
And uh, I'm again reiterating the observatories and the OECDs invite to join the government after shock discussion that the observatory is having. We will have many events and many discussions uh, around these topics leading up to the November. Um, but it's really uh, towards the kind of the aim to not bounce back to actually use this opportunity to uh, kind of reform government or rethink government of how we are doing things. So we see this great opportunity for innovation for better. So we hope to also seize it. Uh, thank you on my part. I also say thank you to Kent, Heather and Sam who are in the background of actually making this uh, webinar happen. Thank you to all the participants and the panelists again. Thanks guys. Thank you very much. Thank you.